Amen and amen. <clears throat> oh, good evening, my peeps. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Micah as we pick up where we left off last week. Um, let's go to Micah chapter, chapter 3. We finished the first of three visions that are given in forms of, of a message. And so this message was given to the people in the book of Micah. As I've shared be, with you before, that this, this he, he's, he's from the southern kingdom. The message is, for, is about the northern kingdom as well, but his audience is the southern kingdom, and that's where he's from. And that first vision, he, predi he predicted that the Assyrians would be coming, and they would be coming to destroy the northern kingdom. And, and, and even when the Assyrians came towards the northern kingdom, they came all the way down into <clears throat> the southern kingdom, and they took several cities, but they got right to the gate of Jerusalem. But the Lord did not allow them to be destroyed yet. It would be about another 135 years that Jerusalem would be destroyed. Um, but at that time that he is writing this, he's talking about what would be happening to the northern kingdom. And, and that would be taking place in, 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 in years. It wasn't going to be, you know, a, th a hundred years, but it would be years um, that uh, the northern kingdom would be destroyed. And like most judgments that we see against the nation of Israel, especially as we've been covering the minor prophets, there is always a ray of hope. Um, that to remind us that the judgments that we see against the, ju the, the, the nation of Israel are not permanent. They're temporary. Now, even though I say temporary, some of these judgments and some of the consequences that happened to them lasted hundreds of years. And again, I, I think for us as a nation, we've been around 244 years. It's like, man, that's a long time. It's like sometimes the judgment for them lasted a hundred years and and even we see thousands of years because even to this day there's still judgment coming against God's people because of their disobedience but there will always be a ray of hope and we saw that in the last couple of verses of the last chapter that even though the Lord is going to bring the people together from time to time we saw that throughout the history of Israel but he was actually talking about the millennial kingdom, which is still ahead. And so, but they will be brought back for good at that time. And so we're in Malachi chapter 3. Let's read the first seven verses. Malachi. Oh, I'm sorry. Micah. Yeah, we're in Micah. Did I say Malachi? Okay, if I say Malachi today, I mean Micah. Okay. Because now it's in my, my brain without even thinking about it. So we're in Micah. Micah chapter 3. Is everybody there yet? <laughs> man, and I was on a roll too, man. <laughs> Old Malachi there. Oh, Micah. No, I'm kidding. Okay, so Micah chapter 3. Let's read the first seven verses. It says, and I said, Hear now, O heads of Jacob, and you rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know justice? You who hate good and love evil, who strip the skin of my pe from my people and the flesh from their bones, who also eat the flesh of my people, flay their skin from them, break their bones and chop them in pieces like meat for the pot and like flesh for a cauldron. Then they will cry to the Lord and he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time because they have been evil in their deeds. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who make my people stray who chant peace while they chew with their teeth, who, but who prepare war against him who 
puts nothing in their mouths. Therefore, you shall have night without vision, and you shall have darkness without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets, and the day shall be dark for them. So the seers shall be ashamed, and the diviners abashed. Indeed, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer from God. The, the second chapter that we will be covering here goes from, or the, the second vision that we see here goes from chapters 3 to 5. In, in this second message, uh, the emphasis is somewhat different from, from the, 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 the two two of the three chapters here, because chapters 4 and 5 will give us more of a a ray of hope, as I've been talking about as we covered the last two verses of the last chapter. This chapter gives us the warning, the judgment that is to come. But in the the last two chapters of this vision, he, he gives and he discusses the blessings that will come upon Israel and Judah. Again, there's always that ray of hope. And I think oftentimes we read the, the judgment and that we get this much of the ray of hope. But this time in this vision, he gives us a ray of hope or, 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 or judgment. But he gives us a lot more ray of hope. And that will be in the next two chapters. And so chapter 3 details the sin of the leaders of Israel. And of Judah. Again, Israel speaking of the northern kingdom, Judah the southern kingdom. But he is speaking here in the first several verses, he is speak, speaking to the civic leaders. He will be also speak to the religious leaders. And he will call them, as he called them out last week, these, 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 these false prophets these false prophets that, that would tell the people what they wanted to hear, not what they needed to hear. And throughout scriptures, God's plans for the future are always given not simply to inform the people of what will occur, what will transpire, what will happen to them, but he also gives them this information, if not more so, so that there would be this motivation to turn back to the Lord to change their lives, to have some kind of repentance in their hearts. And it's interesting because when we talk about the judgments of God, oftentimes we we have seen that He had given them time and time and time to repent. And I think that even as, as the church, we often think like, well, God doesn't discipline. Sure He does. He, he allows discipline in our lives. But that's why He gives us the opportunity to repent. That's why we are told throughout the Word that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we are to do that on a regular basis. But if we don't, if we continue in our disobedience, He will eventually let us be disciplined. And so that's why, again, for us as believers... We should have a short leash when we sin and turn right around and ask God for forgiveness. And this is, and I don't know if you ever feel this way, but you're going, but I do this all the time. It's like, yes, and he wants you to repent all the time. And I know that sometimes there's that frustration. It's like, but I constantly mess up. It's like, he knows that. But you see, the nation of Israel, they constantly messed up as well. But they didn't have the wherewithal because of their leaders, whether civic or religious leaders, to turn back to God. They just continued going on their merry way. And this is why, again, when we're looking at a lot of this judgment in the minor prophets, he had given them time to repent and they did not. And so again, he not only informs them of what's going to happen, but he did it so that they would have this this conscience of turning back to God. <clears throat> now, for sure, the promises of Israel's future, their, their blessings, <clears throat> would come to this nation. 
But first, its leaders had to turn to God. If the leaders weren't going to turn to God, then the people were just going to go after the leaders and, and, and follow their examples. And then on top of that, there was prophet after prophet who, who was teaching false doctrine. That was teaching the, the, this false religion in so many ways. Not forgetting who God was, but, but adding to who God was. And yet we see that that instead of having this repentant and gratitude for God because he was patient with them, given the fact that he, give, he gave them prophet after prophet after prophet with messages, and they were hard messages. And yet they didn't want to hear that. And so, so in, in, in chapter 3, as he starts off here, he says, And I said, the, the, the prophet knew that there was three different visions that somehow the Lord had given to him, had revealed to him. And he had already conveyed one message to them. And so he kind of continues on after the first message was done. And he proceeds with the next message by saying, And I said. And so he continues on and he says, Hear now, O heads of Jacob, and you rulers of the house of Israel. As with Micah's other two messages, the first and the third, the second one opens up just like the other two, the first one and the, and the third one, by, by using the word hear. He, hear what the Lord has to say through His servant. The word hear, once again, as I shared last week, means to hear intelligently. Pay attention. It has this inference of not only hear it, but obey it. I think oftentimes we, we hear, but we don't obey. And we get ourselves in trouble because we know what the Lord has said, but we don't want to do it. And so the inference here, when he says, hey, I need you to, to hear this, I need you to, to take it in so that you act on it in a positive way to obey what the Lord has to say. It's, it's as though Micah is shouting with a megaphone, listen up, listen up people, God is speaking. And it is very, very important that we hear what he has to say to us. This statement often can remind us, you know, by hearing this, hear what, what the Lord is saying, reminds us of, of, of when Jesus repeatedly admonished those people that he was speaking to when he said to them, he who has ears, let him hear. And, and, and that, that, that saying was, if you have a sense of understanding, then pay attention to what is being said. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. With the inference of, again, act on that. Act on what you hear. Act on what you hear from, from, from the Word of God. When you're reading personally <laughs> and, 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 and you see God speaking to you. And maybe you're a note taker and you're going, man, that was so good. That was so good. And you make all these notes and then you close your Bible and then you go and do whatever you want. He says, hear what I'm telling you. Again, that, that, that we would act on what we read, what we hear from the pulpit even. That we would not just be hearers, but doers, because that is the inference of this whole thing to hear. Hebrews 12, 25 says, See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they, do not, if they did not escape who refuse him who spoke on earth, how much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven? How, how is it that we can turn a deaf ear when we know that this is God's word, that he has spoken to us? He spoke to the prophets. He spoke to the disciples. He spoke to everyone who wrote, wrote this down. And this is his word. How is it that we turn a deaf ear to the God who speaks from heaven, who sits on the throne and loves us and directs us and guides us if we obey what he is speaking? Because you see, it's a dangerous thing 
to turn a deaf ear to the voice of God when He speaks. And, and we need to understand that the Lord is always faithful to speak. I know that for us, I, I have a tendency of saying, but we don't always hear clearly. And I think that's even a cop-out for me because I think it's not that hard to understand. We just don't like what it says. And it's almost like with our kids, it's not that they don't understand what you're saying. They just don't like what you're saying. And then you tell them again and you tell them again and you're going, do you not understand? It's like, nope. And it's like, I know you do. Because if it's something that you really, really like, Man, you understand it well. And I think the Word of God is the same way. I don't think it's difficult to, to understand. I just think we don't like what it says at times, and we don't want to do it. And so we're going, oh, I, I, I don't know what God's telling me right now. It's like, I think you do. And so if you're faithful in reading His Word, I, I think you know what He says. You just want different options. And when he doesn't give you those options, you're going, Lord, okay, I read it, you confirmed it, but I don't know. And, and so the people here, again, they, they knew that God was faithful. They just didn't like what he said. And when he used guys like, like Micah who came in and they had some harsh words to say, they would much rather listen to the false prophets who would tickle their ears and tell them what they wanted to hear. And that's a danger. God speaks. And back then he was speaking through the prophets. And he would raise some of these prophets up. And it wasn't a multitude of them. It was a few of them. Again, his contemporaries here, Micah's contemporaries at this point were, were Hosea and, and, and um, Amos. Isaiah would come just a little later. But he would send, peop send people to, to have these messages from God. And it's interesting that, that all of creation <laughs> responds to the voice of God. And they, they gladly obey His will, except for man. <laughs> man, the one that's made in His image. <laughs> and I think oftentimes, and, and I think we saw this even in the book of, of Jonah, that when God spoke to the wind, or go, spoke to the fish, or spoke, however, to the plant, or whatever, they all did what, what God wanted them to do, except for His man, the prophet. He said, see you later, I don't want to do that. And it's interesting how that works. Yet he's such a loving father to us. And like a loving father, he tells us in, in Proverbs, and I'm going to give you several scriptures tonight if you want to write them down. But he tells us in Proverbs chapter 7, verse 24. Now therefore, listen to me, my children. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. Again, you, you, you see the affection and you hear the affection that the Lord has towards His, those who are His. My little children, my children, pay attention to what I have to tell you. Now, now previously, Micah addressed his comments to God's people kind of in a general sense. But, but now he specifically speaks to, to these who are the heads, the rulers, the, the, the leaders. Because they <clears throat> had a special responsibility. And there would be an accountability that came with that responsibility before God. Because He had put these people to rule over His own people. And so that's who he's speaking to, the heads and the rulers. The heads of Jacob, the, the, the rulers of, of Israel. So he's talking to both nations. And he says this. Is it not for you to know justice? Is it not for you to know justice? The, the Lord allowed <clears throat> man to form societies, communities, 
He, he allowed them, as the world was growing, as they sectioned themselves off, that, that in, in each society there would be some kind of a, a government to where people were set up in a position to govern other people. And it would be for those people, those leaders, to know justice. To know the difference between good and evil. So that that society can function. Now even though there was nations that did not have the law of God, like the nation of Israel, that he spelled it all out for them. The law of Israel, it, it, it described to them what was good and what was evil. But all the other nations, they, they lived by those kinds of principles, even though they hadn't had those. Just like tribes today that we would look in the Amazon or, or, or way out wherever they might be in India or wherever, that, that they have not even heard the gospel. Yet there's a form of, of government in those, in those tribes, in those societies. There's certain things that are good. There's certain things that are evil in every society. They have a sense of what is good and what is bad. And, and in whatever society, whenever there is something that is wrong, there's people which would be the tribesmen or the, the elders or whoever they were that people would go to and say, judge this. Tell us, tell us what's going on here, if it's right or wrong, and what's the punishment for that. And so we see that in every society. That's the only way that a society can truly function. By having principles of what is good and what is evil. But he tells them, his people, that had the law of God. You who hate good and love evil. Isn't that for you to know justice? You're the ones that we have to go to and you decide what happens <laughs> to us. And I can't help but think of, of the place that we find ourselves in this world. And that's not just the United States, but in this world. There are those who hate good and love evil. And you almost think like, how can anybody get a fair shake if, if justice is not blind? If they already have a prejudice against a certain people, a certain, a certain group of people. Again, a, a, a society cannot function. If they hate good and love evil. Because I think that it's only a matter of time in any society. When good is called evil and evil is called good by the powers that be. It's only a matter of time before people begin to take matters into their own hands because if I'm not going to get justice in the court of law, then I'm going to have justice in my own neighborhood or my own house. And that's not the society that God wanted for people. He put people in positions so that they would know justice because it's for them to know that. And yet, they hate good and love evil. But the indictment that the prophet Micah is bringing up is that the, the heads and the rulers of the nation as a whole, they had forsaken justice. And they had forsaken justice for their own gain. It's a dangerous slippery slope when those in government begin to choose the winners and the losers in whatever society and they forsake what is right and what is what is just he says you who strip 
the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones. You who eat the flesh of my people, flay their skin from them, break their bones and chop them up in pieces like meat for a pot and like flesh in the cauldron. If this indictment it, it wasn't bad enough, Micah goes on to illustrate this, this horrible and terrible thing that the heads and the rulers of the nation were doing. They, they were using people. And he gives us this, this ugly picture, if you will, of these almost ravenous animals. And, and if it wasn't the animals, man, he, he's going, you, you people are doing this to other people, and it almost has, you almost want to go, man, it, it, it just almost count, sounds like cannibalism, that you're eating your own people up. Now, again, it, it's, it's probably a figure of speech. They, they weren't doing that literally, but what they were doing with the injustice of the people was just like that. They were tearing them apart, and they had no hope. They couldn't win in the court of law. As we shared last week, or, or two weeks ago, whenever it was, they, they, they rose up early, because that's when the courts were in session. And yet they, they went in there and they took advantage of the court system, because they could, because nobody was there to stop them. And so in a sense, they were, they were chewing up and spitting out the people. And so he gives us this almost grotesque illustration that you would think would have awakened the conscience of the heads and the rulers of the nation who had turned into reprobates. They, 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 were, they were degenerates because of their corruption. The, the, the term public servant should remind us that people should never exist for the sake of the leaders. Leaders are there for the sake of the people. Again, it, it should be in every government. Because God allows people to be put in charge to take care of the society. And when they only take care of themselves, then something happens with the people. And they begin to rebel if they're never going to get a break. And that's where civil wars start. That's where conflict starts. Because all of a sudden, now it's them against them. The elite and, and, and the non-elite. <laughs> the haves and the have-nots. And, and when you turn it into a religious sense, where, where a leader should never serve God's people with, with this dominating question, well, what's in it for me? They, they end up becoming cap, cannibalistic leaders who use people, who chew them up and spit them out. Amos wrote in his letter that we covered a while back, one of his contemporaries, telling the same people, in chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, he says, Seek good and not evil, that you may live. <clears throat> so the Lord of hosts will be with you as you have spoken. Hate evil, love good. Establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Again, they had heard this message before by another prophet who, who spoke about the good and the evil. And he's encouraging them, hey, love what is good. Despise, turn away from what is evil. And here, this prophet is saying the same thing. You who hate good and love evil. Proverbs 8.13 says the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance and an evil way and a perverse mouth I hate, says the Lord. 
You, you, you could tell where these people were at with the Lord because of how they, they, they didn't adhere to the justice. They hated good and loved evil and they, they used people. They, 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 they chewed them up and, and spit them out. And he says in verse 4, Then they, the leaders, then they will cry to the Lord, but He will not hear them. He will even hide His face from them at that time because they have been evil in their deeds. this, This would be one of those examples of God's judgment upon these corrupt heads, leaders, rulers. That that when they somehow see judgment coming or things not going the way they thought they should go, that they would cry out to God for help. And he says, and he will not hear them. As a matter of fact, he's going to hide his face from them. It almost seems like that complete opposite of what we hear from Numbers chapter 6, verse 25, where the Lord is telling His people through Moses, and the Lord make His face shine upon you. Not, not, not in this case. Because of their deeds that have been evil towards His people, it's almost like He turns from them he hides his face from them instead of shining his face upon them he turns from them and when they cry out he remains silent what a bad place to be and and i don't know if you've ever been there as a christian where you feel like okay lord i have totally like totally messed up or i'm messing up and you say think well i'm just going to pray and, and, you, and, and I've heard it from people, and you say, Matt, I don't even think my, my prayers reach the ceiling. I don't, I don't think my, my voice can even be heard in heaven. Because you feel like God is not even listening. But you see, again, in this situation, it is because of the evil that they continued to do. And even when they cried out to the Lord, it was only for their benefit. It wasn't a repentance. It wasn't a change of heart. They, they just like help. We need help. And God says it's because these rulers and these heads, because they have been, been more like ravenous beasts than they have human beings. And instead of being faithful shepherds to the people to protect their flock, they, they, they beat the sheep, they hurt the sheep, they attack the sheep. Skinning them alive, if you will, butchering them, chopping them up. Made stew out of them. But the prophet prophesied that the day would come when these wolves in shepherd's clothing... <laughs> would cry out for mercy and God would say, no, no mercy for you. Deuteronomy 31, 17 says, then my anger will be aroused against them in that day and I will forsake them and I will hide my face from them and they shall be devoured and many evils and troubles shall befall them so that they will say in that day, have not these evil, has not this evil come upon us because our God is not among us. Micah was speaking of a time when Israel would be taken away captive. When the northern kingdom, when the heads and the, the rulers and the leaders who had refused to believe God, would actually, they they, they refused to believe that God would actually follow through and punish them. They really honestly thought, God God wouldn't allow bad things to happen to, to me. And yet, as they were being carried away captive, 
they would come to realize that God was actually now punishing them. And by then it would be too late for God to deliver them because he had already said, this is what's going to happen. They would have to live with the consequences of their disobedience, of their actions that they, they continue to do without any repentance. He, he calls their deeds evil because of what they did to God's people and to the nation. Now understand, God listens to all prayer. He, he hears everything. He cannot stuff his ears to where he cannot hear. But there are times that he refuses to, to act because he has to allow, allow punishment or, 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 or even discipline to come through. Or, or else he, he, he's not a man of his word. He's not a God of his word. I think oftentimes we, we get ourselves in situations and we want immediate relief right now, Lord, because right now my heart is so sincere right now. And he's saying, great, that's what I wanted. But I got to let you go through it. And you're going, no, please, no. And it's like, I have to. I have to allow this to happen in your life so that you could learn your lesson. Now, again, that's why he calls us to repentance time and time and time again as believers so that we don't continue in our sin. His goodness, His kindness should lead us to repentance. The fact that He doesn't snuff us out the moment we sin is showing His kindness and His goodness to us. And He gives us that opportunity to repent. And guys, God is so long-suffering. And I think that we know that. And we take advantage of that. That even when He allows consequences... He somehow reminds you, even through it all, that He has not forsaken you. He has not left you. Again, He, he, he allowed the nation of Israel to go through what they had to go through because of their sin, and yet their punishment, their judgment was not permanent. It was temporary. But they still had to go through the consequences of their actions. By contrast, faithful leaders protected their charge, their duty, their responsibility. And they looked out for their welfare, the welfare of the, of the people. And King David was one of those. One of those faithful leaders. He, he was the epitome of a, of a good leader. And we know David's life. He wasn't perfect. God had taken him from shepherding sheep to becoming a shepherd of his people. And God showed kindness to him. Didn't have to, but he did. But yet, there was a repentant heart in David. That, 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 that in Acts, it says that, that David was a man after his own heart because he knew how to repent. He knew how to turn back to God. And yet, he, he, he led his people well because he understood what shepherding looked like. The people in Micah's day were being betrayed by their, their, their heads and their, lead, their rulers, their, their leaders. Because if they really, really cared for their people, they, it would have been the leaders themselves that would have turned the people back to the Lord. But they just continued to go their own way. And the people just followed. In verse 5, he says, Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets. So now he, he, he kind of makes a little switch here from the, the civic leaders, and now he goes to the religious leaders. Thus says the Lord to the prophets. He, 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 he turns from the, their corrupt deeds that they were doing, these, these leaders, these heads, these officials. And now he's going to come after the religious leaders. Jeremiah 5, 30-31, he says, An astonishing and horrible thing has happened or has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power, and my people love to have it so. 
But what will be their end? Or what will be the end? When, when God is left out of human government, it's easy for the officials to use their authority selfishly to exploit the people. It's just human nature. But, but when the religious leaders jump on board and, and, and kind of emulate what, what the officials are doing and you're going, man, they, they, they have taken it to a whole new level. Instead of justice, you, there's injustice within the religious leaders. And so he says, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who make my people stray who chant peace while they chew with their, their teeth, but who prepare war against them, who put nothing in their mouths. As long as the people or the religious leaders were getting things from the people, eating and drinking, the, the, the prophets, they declared to them whatever message they wanted to hear. <laughs> but when they didn't get what they wanted from the people, they declared war on them by leading them astray. By declaring war on them. It says, nights, they will have night without vision. They shall have darkness without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets and the day shall be dark for them. It's interesting because these people, the religious people, were supposed to be the light for the people. And yet, he says, all of that is taken away. What, what, what you now have, you can't see because you're in darkness. That is your life. You've been walking in that place. And instead of knowing where to lead the people, you're just telling them whatever they want to hear because you have no vision. Because you have no authority to really lead them because it's darkness. Again, they had been teaching people, telling people whatever they wanted them to, to think. And yet, they also, like the, the, the civic leaders, never thought that God would actually judge them. And then suddenly, judgment came. And it's interesting because he says in verse 7, So the seers shall be ashamed, and the diviners abashed. Indeed, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer from God. It almost seems that when this judgment came and the people finally hit them up going, well, wait a minute, you kept on telling us peace and peace and this would never happen to us. These prophets had nothing to say because they didn't know what God was saying. They would also cry out <laughs> and God would not answer them. The Living Translation puts verses 5, 6, and 7 like this. New Living Translation. This is what the Lord says. You false prophets are leading my people astray. You promise peace for those who give you food, but you declare war on those who refuse to feed you. Now at night, you close. now the night will close around you, cutting off all your visions Darkness will cover you. Put an end to, to your predictions. The sun will set for the, the prophets and your day will come to an end. Verse 7, then the seers will be put to shame and you fortune tellers will be disgraced. And you will cover your face because there is no answer from God. Let's read the rest of the chapter. Verse 8. But truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. 
and of justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgressions and to Israel his sin. Now hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel who abhor justice and pervert all equity, who build up Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with iniquity. Her heads judge for a bribe. Her priests teach for pay. Her prophets divine for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? No harm shall come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed like a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins. And the mountain of the temple like a bare hill in the forest of the forest. In, in contrast with the leaders that we looked at from verses 1 through 4 and the false prophets from 5 to 7, who, who had not, the, the, these, these, these false prophets, they had not been speaking the message of God. And, and again, not all of them had the message of God, but there, there's one that comes on the scene and he has a message from God and it's not quite what they are preaching. And, and, and they kind of set him aside as, as being the one that, that has the wrong message because they all were speaking the same thing and, 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 and telling the people what they wanted to hear. Yet they were the ones that were considered false. And yet Micah comes on the scene and in his message he says, but, but truly I am full of the power of God, basically. I, I have the Spirit of God and I have the power of God and, and, and the Lord has given me justice and might to be able to declare what is not popular. Because that's the message that God wanted the people to hear. Something that was not popular because they were in a bad place. Micah's words were, were justice because God, God was carrying out his judgment. And, and Micah's words had might because God had totally, he, he had total capability of carrying out what he said he would. And, and, and perhaps these false prophets, they, they didn't want to be harsh. And I think oftentimes, even in our own lives, and even from this pulpit, there's messages that we have to share. And people are going, man, can't you just go up there and sing Kumbaya for a little bit and make us all feel good? It's like, yeah, that would be awesome. But there's times that we're going through Scripture, and that's not where we're at. And, and, and we need to talk about some of these hard things. Because again, even if you're, if you're reading consistently, if you're reading systematically, you're going to come across things that you do not want to hear. And I think that's where people have a hard time with the Word of God. Because it doesn't comport with what they want in their life. And God's challenging us time and time again. And I've shared with you oftentimes, sometimes when I'm sharing a hard message, believe you me, I've been getting taught it that whole week. <laughs> and we need to hear those things. That these leaders, they dealt unjustly. The, the, these prophets had no spiritual strength and or authority because they were just tickling the ears of the people and giving them what they wanted to hear. And yet Micah was not afraid. He, he wasn't afraid to declare the, tra the transgressions of, of, of Jacob and the sins of Israel. He knew it wouldn't be popular. But Micah was able to see God, God's perspective of what was going on. There, there's things that I, I watch sometimes on, on, on YouTube and, and there's these guys who, who are popular pastors and, and they, 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 they go on these shows and they can't 
quite pinpoint what sin really is. And then, then there's another guy, man, he says, man, boom, this is what it is. And, and he's not the one that's being asked to go on talk shows because it's not a popular message to talk about what sin really looks like. Where other pastors are like, well, you know, I, I'm not here to judge. I don't want to, you know, and again, it's like, man, this is exactly what we have here. Micah wasn't afraid to say, no, this is what the Word of God says. And again, when people say, well, what's your opinion? You don't want to know my opinion. I'll tell you what God's Word says. Because this will be truth. This will speak justice. But he could see God's perspective of what was going to happen to the nation. And I, and I truly believe that it was obvious to anyone. It was obvious to anyone who really wanted to see and know what God was saying. Because a true prophet is not afraid to declare God's message regardless of whether people like it or not. Now, again, I'm not, I'm not here to say, hey, man, man, we should be up here beating you guys all the time. It's like, unless that's what the word is telling, it's like, no, beat, beat them right now. But give them a ray of hope. <laughs> Sprinkle it with some grace, you know? Because there are those people, there are those pastors just, man, they are just beating the sheep, beating the sheep, and they think this is what they need. It's like, well, if that's what God's telling you. But again, there's always that balance. But you never want to be just one of those guys that's just like, oh man, God is so good all the time and, and you will never suffer and you will never go through. And it's like, I'm sure Micah at one point man thought, man, Lord, I wouldn't mind being one of those peacemakers. But right now you've called me to be a troublemaker, to speak truth. And so at the end here, again, he, 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 he talks about Israel being destroyed. That, 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 that these rulers, these heads, they have hoarded justice and perverted equity. He, reiterate, he reiterates by telling them, hear this. Again, listen to what God is saying. The word abhor means to loathe, to despise, to morally detest. And that's a, it was a strong word that he was using towards these people that they abhorred justice, but it was meant to be harsh. The word pervert means to, 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 to not or distort. Figurative to pervert and act or declare perverse. To make crooked, to twist. The word equity means straight. Just, pleased, well, right, or righteous. The, the, the word equity in the English language would, would have words like even-handedness, fairness, impartiality, justness would apply to that. And what was supposed to be right, what was supposed to be straight, these people were making crooked. They were perverting it. They were twisting it. And he finishes off by talking about, in verse 12, Therefore, because of you, because of you, you leaders in the civic realm and in the, the religious realm, Zion, Israel, or, or Jerusalem, shall be plowed up like a field. Jerusalem shall be a heap of ruins, and the mountain of temple shall lay bare in the forest. And he had said this about, about uh, uh, the northern kingdom, about Samaria, in, in back in chapter 1, verse 6. <clears throat> and eventually it would happen to the southern kingdom. Let me read to you Deuteronomy 6, um, 18 to 20, and we'll close up. He says this, You shall appoint judges and officers in all the gates, which the Lord your God gives you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality, nor take a bribe. For the blind 
For the bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. You shall not follow what is altogether, you shall follow what is altogether just, that you may live and inherit the land which the Lord God has given you. Again, he says, this is the way to do it. This is not the way to do it. And he had spelled it out plainly for them through the book of Deuteronomy. And yet they ignored it. And because of that, they would fall into the same trap as the northern kingdom. And so uh, Micah was there giving the message that was not popular, but it had to be said. And with that, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you. Thank you for your word, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for the book of Micah. We continue to pray, God, for wisdom and direction, Lord, as we hear messages like this, Lord, that would remind us, Lord, that your goodness leads us to repentance, Lord, that when we fail, that when we do the things that are not righteous, the things that we we do that we can use people and hurt them, Lord, that, Lord, you would convict our hearts and that we would obey, that we would turn, Lord. I thank you for the examples that you give us through your word. Father, for, for, for messages like this, Lord God, that remind us that our human nature can be wicked. But yet you've called us, Lord. You've called us out of that. To do what's right, Lord. To love what's good. To shun evil. And so, Lord, we pray that you continue to move in our hearts and in our minds. And we once again thank you for your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing this last song. Bless you guys.